1st of July of 2004. Wow, that's a very long, impressive tenure. Um, where were you living at the time? Lewiston, Maine. It's where I was born. We lived, uh, growing up, we lived there and in Berlin, New Hampshire. Why did you want to go to the Air Force Academy? Uh, I started to pursue uh, West Point uh, initially. Uh, my girlfriend in high school was going to the uh, College of New Rochelle and wanted me nearby. So I checked into West Point, and they didn't have an appointment. Senator Muskie didn't have an appointment there, but said he uh, had one at the Air Force Academy. And so I did a little research and thought that would be uh, a good thing to do. The price was right. I was accepted at the University of Notre Dame, which would have been a stretch for my parents financially. And uh, so I decided to, uh, to apply to the Air Force Academy. Interestingly, I went into the uh, guidance counselor in the fall of my senior year in high school, and he told me not to even bother applying. I'd never get in, and that I ought to be, go to the University of Maine and, and be happy with that. And I decided to go ahead and apply anyway, and uh, got a nomination. Senator Muskie had to give a civil service test is how he, uh, one of the ways he determined who would, uh, uh, who would win the nomination. And then uh, I got an appointment after that, after being nominated, and my principal said, uh, congratulations, but I would probably never graduate because my math skills were so weak that uh, I probably wouldn't uh, be able, because it was a very rigorous math program at the academy, and I was, uh, that my school didn't have a particularly strong program, and I didn't do particularly well in it. And uh, sure enough, in the fall of my freshman year, at the mid-semester, I had an F in a 7.5 credit hour math course. And I went into um, the math department because at the academy, one of the great things about the academy is you can always get a tutor. The answer is always yes if a, if a cadet wants to be tutored. And I went in and at random, knocked on a door, and there was an older major. And I introduced myself and said I was in deep trouble and I'd like some help in math. And he said, beggared, beggared. I served in World War II with a guy named Beggart, Carl Beggart. So that's my Uncle Carl, yeah. He says, come in here, Cadet Beggart, I'm going to teach you math. And he spent the next month getting me caught up to my classmates, and I, I had a C at the end of the semester and, and uh, caught up to my classmates and uh, surprised everybody back home. Wow. So long answer to a short question, but, but it's... Uh, it's Interesting, sometimes people can uh, put obstacles in your way and you just can't let them do that. At that point, you certainly didn't know the long, extensive career you were going to have with the Air Force, but looking back on it afterwards, what do you think of the training you received at the Academy? Oh, it's first class. The, the academics are first class, the leadership training, the ethics training, uh, the physical uh, fitness part of it all top-notch, top in the country as far as I'm concerned. I'm still very active out at the academy supporting their programs. Uh, but it, it really set, set me on my adult life on a, on a course that, uh, looking back, I wouldn't have had any other way. I didn't appreciate it as much going through it as I do now, but I will say within a few years I appreciated it. It wasn't a long time. Um, once I got flying and, and uh, growing up a little bit in my 20s, I uh, appreciated it more and more. Do you have any memorable experiences from the academy? Oh, tons. It's a. Uh, it's. Uh, I could probably go on for days with stories and uh, great memories that I have of classmates and and uh, some funny, some sad. Uh, but a, a few things. When I first entered the academy in '64, the Vietnam War was just getting started, and uh, I can remember going out to San Francisco. Uh, in the summer of 65 on an official trip and uh, being stopped in the street in uniform and having men who had served in World War II stop us and uh, shaking our hand and thanking us for our service, which I thought was, you know, really, at that point in my life, I didn't appreciate all of that. Uh, and uh, that, that really struck me in 1965. Well, by 1967 and 68, you had to be careful wearing your uniform off base. We traveled in at least twos. Otherwise, uh, you could get confronted and, 
and uh, other college kids from other colleges would, would come after you. And so the Vietnam War really changed in those, those three short years from 64 to 67. It was a whole different mood in the country, which changed dramatically during my, my tour at the academy. The other thing I remember is uh, some of the 65 graduates who were seniors when I was a freshman, by the time I graduated, there were some who were killed in action, some who were POWs. And uh, that, that also made uh, quite an impression on me as to what I was going into. When you were in the academy in the Vietnam War, was heating up, did you realize that you would be over in Vietnam? Oh, sure. I mean, everybody, we all knew that. That's what we had signed up to do. We were, we're all volunteers. We entered the academy. Uh, we knew that uh, we were going to be commissioned officers. Most of us wanted to fly. And uh, everybody was going to Vietnam at one point after, after pilot training. Did you receive your flight training while you were still in the academy? We had some flight training, but you entered a formal course of pilot training after. So the academy takes you through. They have a bunch of aviation programs from gliders to parachuting and including soloing in a, in a uh, Cessna. And so I went through the uh, Cessna training, got a feel for it. This was in my senior year. And then uh, following graduation, went to formal pilot training down in San Antonio at Randolph Air Force Base. It's a year-long course. When you were at Randolph, what did they train you in? You, again, the same uh, Cessna T-41, it's called, that uh, I, I had flown at the academy. And then a T-37, uh, and then finally a T-38. So each one a higher performance until you get to uh, essentially a small jet fighter, which is the T-38. Did you choose what you wanted to go into as far as flight, or did the Air Force tell you what you wanted to go? What they did is they, uh, they give you... Uh, choices of a menu of airplanes they need new pilots for and then they at that in those days they took the top graduate got the first choice second third fourth etc in my particular pilot training class the menu was somewhat limited there was only one fighter in the whole class and but there was a brand new airplane that I was uh, very excited about going to and that was the C141 and so that's what I chose and can you tell me a little bit about the C141 C-141 is a uh, four-engine cargo airplane. It was brand new at the time. They are now all retired. But at the time, it was brand new. Uh, it's a strategic airlifter, flies uh, intercontinental uh, as well as domestic missions. Uh, it was uh, very, very uh, exciting to be in that and a great way to learn to be, uh, to be a good pilot. You start as a co-pilot, you get up to a first pilot, and then an aircraft commander. So I went from pilot training to further training in the 141 at Altus Air Force Base in Oklahoma, followed by uh, my first operational assignment at Dover Air Force Base in, uh, in Delaware. And that's where I flew the C-141 for uh, the next 14 months. Managed to get upgraded to Aircraft Commander, made multiple trips to, uh, to Vietnam. Uh, at, least, uh, at least once a month we would go to Vietnam, went to Central and South America, went to Europe, Middle East, actually sat alert during uh, September of 1970 for the potential airdrop of troops into uh, Jordan when the Black September tried to take over the country. And, and uh, our, that was the first almost combat other than Vietnam that, uh, that I had, had flown up to that point. But it was a great place to cut my teeth as a pilot uh, for those 14 months. Got about 1,000 hours in that airplane. Now, that was when you were at Dover? Yes. And how would you fly over to Vietnam and then come back? We take off out of Dover. We would uh, fly usually to Almondorf, Alaska in Anchorage, uh, and then uh, get off the airplane. Another crew would take the airplane as it was being refueled and fly it on from there. We would go into crew rest, usually alerted 12 hours later, get the next airplane coming through go to Japan, uh, Yokota Air Base outside of Tokyo was a typical base that we would go at. Same thing would happen, we'd leave the airplane, go into crew rest, another crew would take the airplane down to Vietnam. 12 hours later, we'd be alerted, there was another airplane coming through, and uh, we would then fly into Vietnam, offload, onload, uh, fly out of Vietnam, usually into Okinawa at Kadena Air Base in Okinawa. Same thing, uh, we, we would uh, get off, another crew would take the airplane, we'd go into crew rest. A few times it happened that uh, the airplane I picked up in Okinawa to go back to Alaska on the way to Dover uh, 
was the airplane that we had originally taken out of Dover and had already made another trip around the world. And we flew them that hard in those days. So it was one right after the other, and we did it for years that way. Uh, very interesting. We carried all kinds of things into Vietnam. Usually high-priority cargo would be airlifted. Uh, and then very often we would carry out retrograde cargo uh, and very often bodies. Uh, Dover had the mortuary, and uh, it was not unusual for us to carry out 16, 18, 20 caskets uh, on the way home. How big was the crew that you flew with? Typically a pilot, co-pilot, navigator, two engineers, and a loadmaster. It would be a typical crew. And when you fly into Vietnam, where would you fly into? Uh, da Nang, Tonsonut uh, were the two main bases, but uh, all of the all of the bases in Vietnam uh, were flown into that uh, that were major operating bases. But mainly, my missions mainly into Saigon and into Da Nang. And when you were bringing cargo over there, what types of things would that be? Uh, usually, they would be a high priority part to keep airplanes going or to keep tanks running those kinds of things, but it was normally a uh, uh, high priority that, uh, that they needed quickly. Uh, and so the normal cargo went by sea lift for the most part, which is a lot more cost effective than the airlift. But we had a very large force there in, in 69 and 70, 71 when I was flying. And uh, uh, there was 500,000 troops there, so it took a lot of support. Now, it was 69 when you were flying out of Dover? 69 is when I graduated from pilot training. Uh, came out of pilot training, went to uh, survival school, and then into 141 training at Altus, and then reported to Dover in late in 69, and started flying missions really in the January of 1970. And you said you went to survival school? Survival training up in Fairchild Air Base, and outside of Spokane, Washington. It's a... It's a um, Week ten day course where they teach you uh, escape and evasion out in the and surviving out in the wilderness, and then uh, they put you in a in a simulated prison camp, go through simulated uh, interrogations, um, including what's considered torture these days to prepare you for the eventuality if you did get captured, uh, how to deal with it. They teach you uh, at the time what the uh, codes were in, in Vietnam that the prisoners were using to talk to one another, those kinds of things. It was very good training. I'd actually gone through a very similar course at the Air Force Academy, so I was well prepared for uh, the Fairchild. How uh, long course. was the survival training? It, it seems to me it was about 10 days. Oh, so it wasn't like weeks or months? No, no. No, we had some uh, classroom to begin with, and then uh, and then the prisoner of war camp, followed by a, uh, a long trek in the, in the mountains. I went there in... Uh, September of 1969, which was a good time of year to be going through that. How long did you stay at Dover? 14 months. After that, where did you go? Uh, I got uh, selected to go to be a forward air controller in Vietnam, and prior to going, they sent me to Defense Language Institute in Washington, D.C. for six months of French training. And so uh, my wife and I and a small baby went to uh, Washington and stationed at Andrews Air Force Base, went to language school at Anacostia Naval Station outside of, uh, well, actually inside D.C., uh, spent six months uh, learning French, came out of there in, uh, I think, August or so of uh, 1971, and then went down to Fort Walton Beach, Florida for uh, O2 training. O2 is what I flew in Vietnam as a forward air controller. It's a Cessna Super Sky Master. And uh, we did that in the fall of 1971 from September until just before Christmas. Uh, and then had Christmas leave and then uh, reported into Vietnam in the uh, 20th of January of, of uh, 1972. Now, why did they train you in French? Did you have any background in French? I did uh, uh, in high school, and I grew up in a French-Canadian sort of uh, uh, home uh, home life with on my mother's side. And uh, uh, but that's not why I got selected for French language school. Uh, it was tied to my fac assignment. The idea was that we would go and fly out of Saigon and work with the Cambodians. Uh, 
in, uh, as they were trying to uh, repel the communists from their country, and they were primarily speaking French at the time. And so that's what the training was intended to do. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, what a fast pilot is trained to do and what, what the, the role of a fast pilot is, and that's forward air control? Forward air controller is um, usually you fly alone, and you're going out, and you're... Um, there's a few missions that we did. One was to work with the ground commanders, uh, especially if they got in trouble, and then you would bring in airstrikes. We carry normally marking rockets. Uh, we call them Willie Peets, white phosphorus rockets, and we would mark the target and then talk uh, fighters into dropping bombs or rockets or strafing wherever we said, and uh, they weren't allowed to do it without us normally when we were in support of ground troops. So that was a, a high priority mission that we did. We also flew out in the Ho Chi Minh Trail in both Cambodia and Laos and tried to do interdiction missions, uh, looking for uh, supply convoys, anti-aircraft guns, all those kinds of things. Um, and then we worked uh, behind enemy lines a lot of time, and especially in 1972, which we can talk about in a minute during the Easter invasion, on a very conventional warfare, not a guerrilla warfare, killing tanks and artillery pieces and all of that. So a lot of reconnaissance, a lot of looking for targets, a lot of support of ground troops, and a fair amount of search and rescue missions. We were normally the on-scene commanders as we tried to get quick pickups of pilots who had been shot down and uh, get them picked up and, uh, and taken back to friendly lines. So those were some of the missions that we flew. Yeah. All fast pilots fly O2s? No, we had uh, O1s, which is a smaller, older airplane. Um, most of them, by the time I got there in 1972, were in the South Vietnamese Air Force and had left the American Air Force. But there were also OV-10s, which was a newer airplane than the O2, and it was uh, more powerful, um, uh, a little more maneuverable, and a very good FAC airplane until the bad guys brought in heat-seeking missiles, and then, then it was less effective because uh, if they tried to get too low, they would get shot down easier than an O2. So my squadron primarily had O2s and OV-10s. How large was the squadron? We had, uh, we had the, the main squadron at Da Nang plus detachments in Play Coup and other places. Uh, the total wing had probably more than 100 airplanes. We ended up consolidating at Da Nang, and we probably had uh, 80 plus airplanes in any given day, plus or minus. We lost, and the year I spent in Vietnam, we lost over 20 airplanes, but we'd get replacement airplanes in when we'd lose one very often. So uh, generally, I would say uh, something greater than 80 airplanes. Can you tell me a little bit about the O2 and its capability and its size? It's a Cessna Super Skymaster. It's a uh, uh, two pilots side by side, although uh, normally we, we did not have another pilot on with us. We flew solo on the left seat. It uh, has two engines, one in the front and one in the back. It's a push-pull airplane, kind of a unique configuration. Uh, very nice that way in that if you lost an engine, you didn't uh, need rudder because uh, you didn't have any, any torque that was throwing you off. The rear engine was actually more efficient than the front engine. The airplane was uh, 4,400 pounds grossed out for weight, which is pretty small. Um, it had uh, uh, extra fuel uh, on it compared to the civilian version. It had a lot of radios, including uh, radios that allowed, allowed us to talk on uh, classified channels. Uh, it had rocket pods, and uh, when they brought in the heat-seeking missiles, we put flares on the wings also. So if we uh, had a heat-seeking missile shot at us, we would punch off a flare and hope that the missile would track on the, the heat of the flare instead of the engine. The problem was anytime I had a heat-seeking missile fired at me, the reaction time was so quick that uh, I never got a flare out in time and was just fortunate not to, not to get hit. A lot of times ground people would say, hey, they just shot a missile at you and, and you try to get a flare off and they was always, the missile was always by me by the time I got to the trigger. So it was good in theory. So were you usually flying by yourself? Normal missions, I would say um, probably 80% of the time flying by myself. I probably flew with uh, two people more than the average guy because I was an instructor pilot and then an evaluator pilot. And so 
I was doing some instruction, checking guys out, giving them check rides and those kinds of things. So I probably flew uh, less solo than some other pilots who, who hadn't upgraded. One of the great advantages of going to the 141 prior to going to Vietnam was I had a lot more hours than the average kid coming right out of pilot training, and so I upgraded pretty fast uh, ahead of my peers. Now, when you actually got in country, which was, that was January 72? Uh, January 72. Uh, were you stationed at the Nang for the entire time? No, and we went to an in-country uh, in uh, base called Phan Rang, where they brought everybody in for a week of orientation. And then uh, it was interesting, I got there along with a lot of other guys who had just graduated from French language school. By the time uh, we got there, they didn't need as many French language speakers as they thought, so we drew names out of a hat to see who would go to Saigon and who would go to Da Nang. Uh, even though I had graduated very, very high on French language skills, it was names out of a hat no matter whether you can speak French or not, this typical military way. Uh, and then I ended up uh, picking and going to Da Nang, which didn't have the requirement for French language. And of course, because of the time lag, all the Cambodians by this time had learned English anyway, and so it was all kind of theoretical. But I uh, got to Da Nang, and they sent me to Pleiku, which is a detachment in the central highlands of Vietnam, where we flew around the Pleiku Kantum area and in the tri-border region of uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. Uh, and I was there for uh, the rest of January, February, and March. And then in March, they closed the detachment down and we moved to Da Nang for uh, a permanent, actually semi-permanent, which I'll describe later, why I went back to play coup later. Do you remember your first impression when you arrived in Vietnam? Uh, well, I had been in Vietnam quite a few times flying 141, so no big first impression that I hadn't already made. For instance, the flares at night when they were looking for bad guys coming through the wire, uh, the uh, bomb craters all over the country, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, so no some big surprises for me. I will say one of the impressions I had was our first meeting, and it was the colonel who, uh, who was running the fan rang. And uh, by this time, we had been at war for a long time, and the American people were against the war. Uh, it had been at a relatively low level. The U.S. Army had largely departed, and it was left to the U.S. Air Force, working with the South Vietnamese. And this colonel got up in front of us, uh, us new guys, about probably 30 of us, and said, this blankly blank war is not worth one of your lives. And it made an impression on me because I said, well, then why am I here? If it's not worth it, why am I here? Why should I risk my life when he's saying this? And the fact is, as I became uh, more than aware, is it had nothing to do with politics while you were there or whether the war was right or wrong or anything else. Flying in combat is all about uh, getting the mission done. And, and if you've got troops in combat and you're supporting the ground commander, it's about it's about supporting the friendlies and killing the bad guys. Uh, if you're working a search and rescue operation, it's about getting out the pilot safely and killing the bad guys. And so it's pretty simple when you're actually in combat. It's about each other, not about the politics of why you were there or anything else. So this colonel still, that was pretty demoralizing to hear when I first arrived. Can you... Tell me about a couple of your missions in that year that you were over in country. Um, the missions to begin with in Pleiku were relatively uneventful in that uh, it was still, uh, it was mostly interdiction. We would get shot at a few times by uh, mostly small arms, which weren't very impressive. Uh, and so it was a good way to learn uh, the combat rules uh, to uh, get, your, get your feet wet get some confidence in your airmanship, and figure out what you were doing. And then everything changed on Easter Sunday in, uh, in, in um, late March uh, of 1972. The North Vietnamese did a conventional invasion, a three-pronged invasion. They came down across the DMZ in the north uh, into Quang Tri province. They came down from Laos, Cambodia into uh, the Central Highlands towards uh, Kon Tum, Pleiku, 
And then they had a major invasion force headed toward Saigon, just north of Saigon, coming out of Cambodia, that they had spent months and months and months uh, building the supplies for and getting ready to come in. We actually watched the buildup of supplies uh, north of the demilitarized zone, but the rules of engagement would not let us hit those. It was very frustrating to be able to see the stuff being built up and not being able to strike it. That's how General Lavelle got in trouble and uh, got fired uh, because uh, he ordered some strikes that uh, were theoretically against the rules of engagement. Um, but when the invasion started, it changed from a guerrilla war to a conventional war, where we had uh, tanks, enemy tanks, enemy artillery. Uh, we had uh, uh, surface-to-air weapons that you normally only saw around Hanoi, Haiphong area. They had moved them into the DMZ and south of the DMZ. And uh, it was very high-velocity combat, where uh, during missions you would get 40, 50 missile launches that you would be warned about, not counting heat-seeking missiles, uh, very uh, deadly uh, anti-aircraft, uh, troops in contact being overrun, uh, and it became uh, very, very exciting uh, for the rest of that year. We actually lost the northern province of uh, South Vietnam as the, the 3rd Arvin Division got overrun. I was with the 3rd Arvin Division a week before they got overrun. And it was quite something to see a friendly force literally be decimated by an enemy force. And then we spent the next three or four months fighting our way back north and, uh, and ejecting the North Vietnamese out of South Vietnam. So it was very much a very different war than, uh, than the other previous years of Vietnam. So it was a very interesting time as a forward air controller. Can you describe first what it was like a typical day before the Easter invasion, what a typical day for mm -hmm. you as a fat pilot would be like, and then a typical day after the mm. Easter invasion. Yep. Down at Pleiku, a typical day would be uh, you'd have a 6 o'clock in the morning takeoff, so you'd get up at uh, uh, 4.30, go eat breakfast, uh, go, go um, uh, get briefed by intel, given a general description of where you were going, who you were replacing, what to expect, uh, any intelligence of uh, any buildup or troops reported, and then you would uh, get a handoff uh, from a guy that you were replacing in that particular area. You um, probably got to actually bring in fighters, maybe one out of three or four missions, where you found something and you tried to strike it and kill it. Uh, so a normal mission, a lot of times you, you'd bring home the rockets or you'd, uh, you'd practice with them, but you weren't doing real missions. Uh, after the invasion, uh, if you had a 6 o'clock in the morning go, same thing, get up at 4.30, have some breakfast, have a much more detailed intel briefing because there was lots of things to brief, a lot of flying being done, a lot of uh, fighters brought over from the states in order to blunt the invasion, a lot of B-52 strikes. Uh, you'd go flying, uh, usually the guy you were replacing had a lot to tell you. You'd work, to work a search and rescue mission for a downed pilot, or uh, you'd go looking for tanks and find them and try your best to kill them. One of the things that we, we uh, tried to do and we had to learn was to find enemy artillery. They had uh, 130 millimeter guns, which were very accurate, very long range, and they were decimating the friendlies. And so what you try to do is put yourself between the gun and the friendlies so that you could see the muzzle flash and then quickly go up to where the muzzle flash was because that would help you find it. Uh, so the, the, uh, you drop weapons almost every single mission that you flew, usually multiple fighter strikes, uh, very often working around B-52 strikes. You were busy. A typical mission, four and a half hours. I would typically lose in the summertime about 10 pounds during those four and a half hours. The airplane wasn't air conditioned. Uh, you drink all the water you could, and you carried extra water with you. But uh, physically demanding, although as a young guy, it wasn't a, wasn't a problem. Um, these days, it would be much harder on the body, but uh, back then, you got used to it. Um, so very, uh, very exciting. For a young pilot, it was the ultimate, as far as I was concerned, in flying, where your aviation skills 
and your competence would mean life and death, not just for you, but for friendlies or a downed pilot or whatever. It was very, very motivational. How often would you fly and then stand down? Were you flying every day? I was flying almost every day. I typically flew uh, more than 100 hours a month. Uh, sometimes we flew more than 120 hours a month, which was uh, not quite legal. We were supposed to not fly, but it was combat, and if you had to fly, you had to fly. Again, as an instructor pilot, a lot of times I would go out and fly a combat mission, and then I would uh, come back in, uh, get something to eat, and get uh, refreshed, and then go up and do a training mission with a new pilot. To, uh, to get training in or get them oriented. What was your rank at this time? I was a uh, captain, young captain. Uh, you, made, uh, you came out of the academy as a second lieutenant. You were a second lieutenant for 18 months. You were a first lieutenant for 18 months, and then you got promoted to captain. How long were you in Vietnam before they made you an instructor? Uh, I got in Vietnam the end of January. I was probably an instructor pilot by June or July, somewhere in that neighborhood. Did you get instruction in being a pilot when you were in Vietnam, or was all your instruction in the United States? Well, uh, what you did was you, you went to Fort Walton Beach, Florida, and you got a rigorous course there to learn how to fly the airplane safely, learn how to do the mission. And then you went and flew uh, several missions with an instructor pilot before they turned you loose. In the United States? No, you fly in Vietnam. So when I was at Pleiku early on in that late January, February time frame, my first few missions, I don't remember how many, were flown with an instructor pilot for probably two or three times, and then they let you go. So not a lot. Two or three times, so I guess that. You, did you feel like you were prepared to go on your own at that point? Oh, yeah, uh, because, again, I, I would not have felt comfortable in the high-intensity combat that we were finding in April. Even then, I sort of considered myself a new guy. By the end of April, May, I was an old head because I'd flown so much. And, but I was still, when the Easter invasion occurred, I was still feeling my way around. I was not a senior guy in the squadron by any means. I was a new guy, and in and I was splitting my time between the, the demilitarized zone and, um, and the Central Highlands, because I was experienced in the Central Highlands, and there was also uh, pretty high-intensity uh, combat going on there with the ground troops. Typically, did you have the same territory? Did you learn the geography of the places that you were flying? You did. When I was stationed at Pleiku, we... We tried to keep to the same area so that you'd know practically every tree, every turn in the road, every possible hiding spot. No, I didn't fly there long enough to be that knowledgeable. And then up by the DMZ, I ultimately knew. But the, the North Vietnamese, of course, picked the monsoon season to launch the invasion because U.S. air power was the, the, the difference. And so we very often flew in very bad weather. We didn't have a lot of visibility. And so I didn't get a chance to study uh, and I, before the invasion, I was transitioning to uh, a Steel Tiger, which was an area in Laos, which was uh, uh, very, very uh, heavily fortified by the North Vietnamese in terms of anti-aircraft, where we flew interdiction missions, and I flew a handful of missions learning that area, only to find myself up by the DMZ when the invasion occurred. So it seems like for the first three or four months, I was constantly learning new areas, eventually became expert and knew every tree, every road, every bush, but it took a while. How low did it O2 fly? When we started, uh, it was 1,500 feet uh, above the ground, and that would get you out of most small arms fire. Uh, if they had machine guns, uh, 50 caliber, they were accurate up to 4,500, so that was your biggest threat day to day, unless you got over into Cambodia, and into Laos, and then they had 37 millimeter and 23 millimeter. Uh, you still had, a, as I remember, about 4,500 feet uh, was your minimum altitude, generally speaking. Uh, so they could get pretty exciting. Then when they brought in the heat-seeking missiles, and it seems to me we lost six or seven airplanes before we figured out that they'd brought in these heat-seeking missiles called SA-7s. And almost overnight, when they find, Intel finally confirmed 
that they were shooting these missiles at us, our minimum altitude bumped up to 9,500 feet, which was a big difference on finding targets. And the O2 didn't put out as much heat from the engines as an OB-10, so we could generally sneak down to 6,500 feet and be okay. Uh, but the OB-10, if it got much below 9,000 feet, the missiles were pretty accurate. What did the O2 have on its arm in it? Just the rocket pods? Just the rocket pods and the flares. Uh, occasionally, if you were flying out of play coup and you worked with the South Vietnamese and you thought you were going to have a slow day, you might be able to get some high explosive rockets or some what we call flechettes. And flechettes were good. They were meant against enemy troops, but they were good for putting a nail through an engine block and stopping a truck and so then you can then uh, destroy the truck. But... Uh, 99% of the time you flew just with the marking rockets and the, uh, and the flares. Now, OB-10 did have uh, a small 51 cal kind of gun, but they really weren't supposed to use it unless it was in dire straits. So basically you were unarmed in terms of self-protection. Did that worry you? Um, only one time when, uh, when the radar plane said there was a MiG Headed headed south that concerned me uh, that that you would have you know an airplane come in or a jet fighter come into South Vietnam uh, that could shoot you down and we did have some facts that were threatened in fact one fact in Laos got shot down by a MiG an OB10 because we were only going 140 150 knots and of course couldn't protect ourselves we'd have to shoot a Willie Pete at them which would make them laugh but not much else. So, can you recall a couple of specific missions that you were on? Oh, I can recall quite a few. Um, one in particular was uh, during the Bat Two One search and rescue. We had had one of our one of our forward air controller airplanes uh, shot down. Uh, it, trying to uh, well, what we did is, we, the Bat-2-1 was an EB-66 shot down by an SA-2, uh, which is a large surface-to-air missile. Uh, and uh, only one guy got out of the four that were in it, and he was in right in the middle of the invasion force. Uh, and Where so, was this? this was in the northern part of South Vietnam, right near the DMZ. Just north of the river, that was about five miles south of the DMZ. And he was hiding, and we, we, we kept a, a, a fac over his head 24 hours a day uh, until we eventually rescued him. But one of these facts got shot down. It was Nail 3-8, and he had a front seater and a back seater, an OV-10. As it turns out, when he got shot down, the front seater ended up parachuting north of the river, and the, the back seater parachuted south of the river. The, uh, the front seater north of the river got captured immediately, became a POW. But the one south of the river was hiding, and uh, my mission on one particular mission was to uh, uh, put down what was a uh, sort of riot gas, but in a powder form, and you put it down on top, and so guys couldn't go in there without uh, gas masks and gear, and so he was isolated uh, from the bad guys picking him up. And it was a bad weather day. It was a ragged ceiling between 500 and 700 feet, so I was flying pretty low. Uh, and I brought in some F4s who were on the deck, and these uh, this CS gas came out in canisters like napalm, and it put they put it right on top of them. They were really, really heroic to be that low uh, and very skilled to be able to find them. And I talked them in through the bend in the river, and they had studied maps ahead of time and all of that. But it was also a very scary mission because uh, uh, the survivor didn't come up on the radio after we dropped the stuff on them, and I knew that they had dropped these canisters right on top of them, and I was afraid we had killed them. And so I was very, very concerned. I ended up uh, staying on station a long time. The guy that replaced me was late coming on, and I really stayed on station too long and uh, made it back to uh, Da Nang. And when I entered the traffic pattern, I had been at uh, zero fuel for about 15 minutes. Uh, I had no fuel in the gauges. And uh, it was raining very hard at Da Nang, and the first approach was a non-precision approach. And uh, 
I didn't see the runway, and so I had to go around. The second approach, I had decided if I didn't find the runway, I was going to go out over the water and then parachute out rather than have the airplane over land run out of gas and hurt somebody. And uh, it turns out uh, the controller did a good job. It was a non-precision approach. And uh, he talked me down, and the first time I saw the runway was after the wheels touched down. And uh, it, that was one of my more uh, memorable, memorable missions. First of all, because I thought I had killed the survivor, and then I put myself in a situation where I shouldn't have. I should have been smarter about it, but uh, I didn't want to leave until there was somebody else there. And I, I, I put myself in a bad situation in bad weather, and I learned from it. As it turns out, he was fine but the gas had made him very, very sick, and so he couldn't talk. And so uh, he ended up going and going down by the river and washing his face and getting it out of his eyes and all of that, and I found out the next day that he was okay. And that they had rescued him? No. Uh, we had tried to go in and, uh, and pick up Bat-2-1 um, with a helicopter. In, in fact, one of my classmates was flying a helicopter, and I was just east of them when they got shot up really good in their helicopter and they almost lost that helicopter and then they made another pickup the next day and they did lose the helicopter, killed all seven guys on board and so after that uh, it became just too dangerous to send in another helicopter, it just wouldn't survive and we, we came up, not me, but we came up with an alternate solution and that was to send a Navy SEAL team led by an American SEAL with some South Vietnamese guys up the river in a boat uh, at night and uh, we were able, first of all, to get out and nail 3-8 Bravo, the guy I had put the CS gas on, uh, by boat at night. And then the following night, they were able to get the Bat-2-1 survivor, Colonel Hamilton, down to the river, although he was in pretty bad shape. And what we had done was, it's an interesting story, he was a golfer uh, from Arizona. And so what we, would, we told him that we weren't going to pick him up with a helicopter, that he had to make his way to the river. And uh, the facts would talk to him and say, okay, tonight, think about the par five at Umpty Ump Golf Course in Arizona, and we're going to bomb ahead of you, and you walk through that hole, followed by the number seven hole at Umpty Ump Golf Course. And so he was able to understand what we were doing and make a dog leg, et cetera, and we just bombed the heck out of, uh, ahead of him as he made his way at night down to the river. And then that seal got all the way up to the river uh, bank where he was, which was quite a long distance, and, uh, and rescued him out that way. Now, you, you had said when you were on station that you would call in uh, the F-4s. Exactly what's that like? Because you're an O-2 pilot. You're not actually firing on, and you're not actually going down to rescue, but your job is to, to bring others in. So exactly how would you call them in? Um, normally they would report in, and uh, I would tell them where I was uh, off the uh, navigational aid from Da Nang. So I would say I'm, I'm uh, 46 miles from Channel 77 at 340, and that would get them in the ballpark of where I was. And then they would find my airplane, and then we'd identify each other. I'd wag my wings usually, and they'd say, okay, you're rocking right, you're rocking left. So they knew who I was, and I'd be able to see them, and then I'd talk them into the target. If it was a good weather day, and I had a river and a road, and uh, they were up at 20-something thousand feet, I could generally get them pretty close to where I wanted them to bomb. And then I, what I would do is I would put down a marking rocket. So if I was working with friendlies, I would normally, if I didn't know the guys, and nine times out of ten you didn't, uh, I'd put them about 500 meters from the friendly and see if they could hit what I was wanted them to hit. And if they were good, then I'd move them closer to the friendlies. Because these guys were also flying missions in North Vietnam where they didn't have to be so accurate uh, in that environment. And so you wanted to make sure that they didn't, we didn't have friendly fire kinds of incidents. And so you'd put down a marking, marking rocket and you'd say, okay, I want you to be north of there by 50 meters and see if they could hit that. And so they'd see the rocket... Willie Pete go off, the white phosphor smoke, and we'd go from there. Can you uh, recall any of your other specific missions? Uh, there's, there's tons, tons of stories. Uh, after the 3rd Division was overrun, uh, we were helping the Americans that were assigned to the 3rd Division uh, 
and they were um, doing escape and evasion in the middle of the invasion force, uh, trying to get south to the next river where we could regroup and establish a line. And so we were talking to these guys at, uh, at night, uh, and one of the uh, guys in my squadron flying an O2 uh, got hit by a heat-seeking missile in his front engine. He, could literally, he wasn't hurt, but he could literally look through his legs at the ground. And um, he was only at 1,200 feet when he was hit, which is pretty low to the ground. But it was bad weather again, and you got to do what you got to do. And he shut off the wrong engine uh, in his emergency procedure, and now he became a glider at 1,000 feet. And he jumped out at about uh, 900 feet. We didn't have ejection seats. He had to crawl out the door or crawl out the window. And he made about, he made about one, one uh, swing in his parachute and landed. Luckily, he landed in the middle of the friendlies. And um, so I was the next guy on station, and I was talking to him that night. And, of course, he was whispering. And we were going to try to bring in some Army helicopters at dawn and, and get him and the Americans out. And we brought in two helicopters at dawn, and the first helicopter, all the South Vietnamese ran aboard it, uh, and they took off, and they got to about 500 feet, and it was hit with a heat-seeking missile and killed everybody on board. Uh, my, uh, my friend, my uh, forward air controller squadron mate, got on the second airplane with the Americans and the remaining South Vietnamese, and they got on the next UE. They stayed on the deck, but they overflew an enemy tank and got shot down with a machine gun. They were all okay, and we sent in a third helicopter and get them picked up. So he was shot down twice in a 24-hour period. And the rule was if you got shot down twice, you got to go home. So he got to go home early, having been shot down twice in 24 hours. So, What was his name? Bill Jankowski was his name. He's a great great guy. I haven't seen him since 1972. But um, he, I know he's still alive and, and doing good. But he was a lucky, uh, lucky man. Can you tell me about any of your missions into Cambodia or Laos? Cambodia was relatively um, uh, uneventful up until the invasion. And then when I flew around the Pleiku area, uh, we had fire bases out there uh, right on the Cambodian border, Dak Siang and Ben Het. And um, these fire bases were under tremendous uh, pressure uh, with the invasion force. Artillery fire as well as uh, guys coming through the wire. And so they fought for a long time and it was bad weather again. We tried our best to uh, uh, bomber after bomber trying to trying to repel the invaders. And finally the, the weather got too bad and Duck Siang fell. It was interesting how it fell. Uh, the remaining troops were, the North Vietnamese came over the loudspeaker and said if they left the base uh, at uh, that night that they would not be fired at and actually they held their word and so because a lot of these guys mountain yards had their families with them and so they all made their way to Ben Het uh, further south and then that became under siege and we flew a number of missions to, to try to keep Ben Het from falling unsuccessfully it was overrun and so it was a it was a game of, of just holding back the bad guys as long as you could and falling back falling back and just bring air power to bear as best you could in the bad weather and just decimate and kill as many of the invading forces as you could till they ran out of steam. And that's what it was like. They never did overrun Khantoum, although they, they tried very hard uh, to do it, and uh, we successfully repelled them. So that was, that was the Cambodian border uh, that became quite exciting. How long were you in that area? Oh, I flew a number of missions down there. Uh, I. I I probably flew 20, 25 missions, something like that, over a period of a month. And eventually that invasion ran out of steam, and it sort of became a stalemate after that. And, and because the provincial capital of Khantoum was not overrun, we didn't have to retake the land. It just sort of became bad guy territory, and we killed anything that moved from then on. Now... At the time you were over there, we were not close to the officially where we were not in Laos or Cambodia. What was the... What was well, that was really earlier. Uh, that was really in the 70-71 time frame, I think. By 1972, we, we did not have any troops, uh, any conventional troops in Laos or Cambodia in, in those days. We had uh, CIA was in various places and all of that. 
but we had air power there, and so it was mainly interdiction mission. And in fact, we never invaded uh, Laos in 72 or Cambodia in 72. It was mainly repelling the invasion was our mission. So that was really not applicable for us. Were you awarded any medals or citations while you were in Vietnam? Oh, sure. I mean, it was all, it was all pretty exciting. But we were pretty busy too. We we didn't worry a whole lot about those things. Uh, I ended up with two distinguished flying crosses and twelve air medals. Um, while you were in Vietnam. While I was in Vietnam. Yep, in '72. And uh, a couple that I was really proud of that uh, were not American medals, but they were Vietnamese medals. I got a uh, Vietnamese gallantry cross with a silver star and a gallantry cross with a bronze star, which were very specific missions that, that, um, that meant a lot to me to have them uh, give that. Can you tell me about those specific missions? Uh, they revolved around, uh, in, in the one case, uh, it, it was uh, a mission where uh, was able to successfully kill some artillery that was really doing a number on the, on the South Vietnamese troops. And I was able to find them, which wasn't easy, and, and bring air power to bear and kill them and, and uh, probably saved a bunch of guys. The second one uh, was a tank invasion across a, a river that was uh, overrunning uh, some South Vietnamese positions and then had an American advisor. His name was Gail Furrow and he and I became friends mostly over the radio uh, although I did meet him in Da Nang one day and uh, the lead North Vietnamese tank was flying a great big North Vietnamese flag and uh, I said if I if I get that tank can I have the flag and he said you bet it's yours and uh, lo and behold uh, by sheer luck uh, an F-4 hit moving tank with a bomb and destroyed the flag, unfortunately. Uh, so I didn't get the flag, but it was a, it was good. And then we used, we started using lasers for the first time, and a nail fat came in, and uh, we were able to laze uh, the middle of the river where four tanks were crossing, and with one bomb overturned four tanks, which was sort of unheard of, and it broke the back of that particular day's invasion. The other guy I worked with there was a guy by the name of Jack Jacobs. And uh, I knew him over the radio. And uh, forward air controllers, uh, we were the only ones where we used the same call sign every day. Uh, and so my call sign was Cubby 26. And it was something we were proud of. The fighters all changed call signs every day, uh, sort of randomly selected. But we wanted the ground commanders as well as the fighters to know us, to know who they could trust or not trust or whatever. And so we kept the same call sign. And so I worked with Jack Jacobs and Gail Furrow quite a bit. And Jack Jacobs, um, you see him today on NBC and CNBC. He's a Medal of Honor winner on an earlier tour in, in Vietnam. Uh, we didn't meet during 1972, but we worked with each other for days and days, uh, both uh, to try to blunt the offensive, and then we retook Quang Tri eventually. And so in 1984, when I went to the National War College, Jack Jacobs was uh, on the faculty of the War College. I didn't know him by name then, but we got talking one day after I'd been there a couple of months, and we started comparing notes of being in Vietnam. And he, he said, you were a forward air controller. What was your call sign? I said, his call sign was Cubby 26. Cubby 26, he gave me a big hug, and we started comparing notes, and when we had, you know, had some exciting days and all of that, and we've become very good friends since then, and we, we stay in contact. And he's now, of course, a, is a Medal of Honor winner, a, a Medal of Honor Society, and, and I've gone to their annual dinner in Wall Street a couple of times and seen Jack, and uh, uh, he and I know each other very, very well now, but it was an interesting... What did you know him as in, when you were not so on the radio? I don't remember his call sign. He had a call sign, but I, I frankly don't, don't remember what it was. But he remembered yours. He remembered mine, yeah, which was, which was interesting. Missions for which you received a distinguished flying cross? Oh, yeah. Every, every uh, distinguished flying cross had a specific mission attached to it. The air medals were a mixture of both specific missions as well as you'd get an air medal, I think, I don't remember, every 25 missions or something like that, you got an air medal uh, for flying in various areas of, uh, of Vietnam. And uh, so I did. I got uh, two distinguished flying crosses, and I think one of my air medals was a specific mission as well. What were the specific missions that you received 
Uh, that would be a pretty high-level mission. Well, one of them was the one I've already described to you with the, the NAIL-38 Bravo, uh, that, that particular mission. And then later there was another mission, uh, a couple of months later, again dealing with artillery. Uh, we, tried, we tried very hard to kill artillery, and, and it made a difference between life and death with the ground folks. And uh, so you'd go, and they were pretty well protected by anti-aircraft a lot of times, and so you had to go find them, and normally that meant you had to fly low. You had to put yourself in their muzzle flash to see it. It took a little skill. Um, and uh, a couple of guys in the squadron, myself and Mickey Fain, we were very competitive over who could kill more 130 guns uh, going, after, uh, going after these guns. As a captain and an O2 pilot, were you involved at all in the battle planning, or would you just receive your mission from your commanding officer? Normally, uh, in normal times, you showed up at Intel, you were assigned an area, and then you were uh, pretty well free to, to do what you were going to do that day, finding targets, killing targets, either working with the ground commander or, or whatever. Where it got into specific mission planning was search and rescue missions, which were very specifically planned. Or in the one case, a couple of cases, as we were going back north to retake Quang Tree, as uh, some of the South Vietnamese forces were getting really banged up doing it, we met with the ground commanders and between a, a captain in the Army, U.S. Army and a, and a FAC captain, we would say, okay, this is what we're going to do because th some of these guys were getting hit really hard and decimating them. And so, for instance, we had a citadel that we were retaking, and a citadel is very highly fortified positions. The bad guys were hiding in the very thick walls. And uh, the South Vietnamese had lost quite a few guys. And we just, we just started plinking bombs uh, on pre-planned missions to, uh, to use air power. And by the time they went into the Citadel, after we finished about two days of bombing, including B-52 strikes, we put down some CS gas, uh, and a B-52 strike just prior to them walking in, they didn't lose a single soldier. And so that was really the most of the mission planning I did. But much higher levels did really the high, the, the really the most of the grand strategy, tactics, all that stuff was done at a higher level. We were, we were busy staying alive and getting the daily mission done. I'm going to switch gears for a minute. I want to ask you a little bit about the daily life. How did you stay in touch with your family when you were in country? Mm, interesting. Letters daily. Got, uh, got a letter from my wife uh, every day. Letter from my mother every day, uh, a few other letters usually, and then once a week usually we got to go in what they call the Mars hookup, and you'd stand in line uh, sometimes for a couple hours, and when it was your turn, it was a short w wave radio, and uh, you'd, you'd get on and you'd allowed, I don't remember how long, it was only like five minutes or so, something like that, a relatively short period of time. And it was a time set up long in advance, and you got to actually talk to your family. And, uh, and then the various radio, shortwave radio operators between you and your family, my wife was in Maine, uh, you would say, I love you, over. And she would say, I love you too, over. And when somebody said over, they did all the switching so that you could, you could talk that way because you couldn't talk simultaneously. And so you'd have sort of a stilted conversation, but boy, I look forward to those weekly phone calls like crazy. Could you actually hear your wife's voice? Oh, yeah. Relay? Oh, so oh yeah. Could no, you could actually, you could, act, oh, you could hear each other, which was pretty special. And you could actually hear in real time. It was just a matter of them switching from listen to talk uh, across the airwaves. And uh, everybody looked forward to that. I had uh, a young son who was a um, uh, little over one years old, and, and uh, so I got to talk to him a little bit, and he could hear Daddy's voice. Uh, that was a pretty special time. So it was letters and the Mars hookup. What was the food like? Food was good. It was an Air Force base. You know, we, the, the Army guys would come, and they were in seventh heaven because they were eating fish heads and rice with, their, with the South Vietnamese troops, and so they'd come onto the base, and uh, I saw him, when I sat down with Gail Furrow one day. He had like a half dozen eggs, and he hadn't had an egg in a long time. So we ate, we ate pretty good. There no complaints on the food. So you had a mess hall and you got three meals a day. We had an officer's club and a mess hall. Had 
had three meals a day. Now you were usually flying through one of the meals, but but you know nevertheless we we didn't. Uh, it was not a hardship. We did just fine. Did you have enough supplies, ammunition, clothing, anything else that you needed? Yeah, that was not a problem. We had all all that we needed. We had uh, no we're ne question. never short of ammo. Never short of of uh, gas. Our airplanes were old, and they were been flying for a few years, and they were pretty beat up. And they were uh, some of them were bent, and they didn't fly straight. And they flew sideways, and and uh, we had young crew chiefs to start out with. And then when the invasion occurred, they sent us a whole bunch of NCOs, and all of a sudden our airplanes got a lot better. They flew better. Um, and, and it was a we could tell the difference, but except for that, we, we really didn't lack for anything. We were being well supported by the chain of command. Did you always have the same exact airplane? Or was it no, you never a different tail number every day. You just got what was available, what was in commission, and off you went. And you got to know them, they had their own personality. Did you feel pressure or stress? It's certainly, in your kind of job, it must have been stressful. You know, it, it, sure, it's stressful. But again, if you're 25, 26 years old, you handle stress pretty well. Uh, but I will tell you, there was no feeling of being bulletproof. I mean, you knew you had friends dying. You, we had a lot of friends I lost over there. A lot of guys got shot down and picked up. Some didn't get picked up. Had uh, guys in my squadron, POWs, MIA, uh, killed in action, you name it. So you didn't feel bulletproof by any means. And so... I'd say the stress was um, you wanted to get the mission done because people depended on you and you didn't want to screw up because they depended on you. And so it, uh, there was a lot of that if there was stress. Um, but you also had a culture in the flying squadron, very macho, uh, nobody showed weakness, you couldn't afford it. Uh, and so you handle the stress in various ways. Some guys drank, some guys gambled, uh, athletics uh, to, to burn off the stress, and, and you stayed really busy. How did you handle the stress? Um, I wasn't a big gambler. I learned how to play bridge, uh, which was a nice way to relax. Uh, I was a big uh, racquetball player. Uh, did a lot of that in the off time, uh, a lot of exercise. Um, a lot of kidding around at the club, go to the bar at night with the guys, uh, singing songs. There's lots of ways to burn off the stress. Um, I learned how to play bridge, which was really nice. Uh, it was a good good way to concentrate on something and and uh, and take yourself away from where you were. Interestingly, we got rocket attacks almost every night at Da Nang during after the invasion, almost every single night. But flying life was 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 uh, was such that the rocket attacks didn't bother you very much. They were lucky if they hit anything that they were aiming at. Did you even get out of the uh, The first, the first, I'd say the first couple of weeks, we you, the sirens would go off, which would give you a, a few seconds warning, usually, and usually hit the floor and went under the bed. After the first couple of weeks, not so much. Although I will say, in November, December time frame, uh, about seven thirty one morning. Uh, it was really, really loud. And it turns out it wasn't a rocket attack. It was a, uh, a mix-up, and F-4s had dropped their bombs on Da Nang. And so they were 32 500-pound bombs dropped not too far away. And we realized after we, we rolled out of bed, and my roommate fell on top of me from the upper bunk, that uh, that was a different sound than a rocket attack, and they were bombs. And uh, they had mixed up their initial point with the target, and they had dropped their bombs on the initial point instead of the target, and, and uh, that, it became pretty infamous. But you got pretty blasé to most of the rocket attacks. What was the name of your base? Denang? It was Da Nang. Da Nang Air Base. Yep, two parallel runways, big base. Um, at one time, the fighter wing was there until uh, uh, when the invasion happened, they had already moved to Thailand. And then uh, we moved into their quarters, which are a lot better than the FAT quarters. But it was a very large, very large complex, um, very busy base. Did you do anything special for good luck? Uh, I wore my uh, high school medal around my neck. Uh, went to went to church. Um, 
one of the one of the benefits of being Catholic in a war zone is that the priest would give you uh, general absolution, so you didn't have to confess your sins. You just got general absolution without confessing. So that was one of the benefits. But uh, I'd go to church every Sunday and get get absolution, and and uh, that that was good. But I wasn't particularly uh, I didn't wear a rabbit's foot or anything like that. What other things did you do for entertainment? I know you said you learned how to play bridge and you did basketball. Yep, and uh, go to the, go party with the guys at night uh, in the club, or our squadron had a bar, and we'd go in there and blow off steam in there. Uh, I was never a big big drinker normally, uh, but it was a good place to go and relax and talk to everybody. Uh, about every six weeks, we got to go to um, Thailand for two days. Went to Ubon usually, and and uh, you could go there and uh, relax. No rocket attacks or danger rocket attacks or anything else, and that was a good stress reliever. Did you get any other leave? Any that were longer? Yep. Uh, Mid-tour in, uh, in the summertime of 1972 in July, I got two weeks off at home, went home to Maine, to uh, Sabbath Day Lake where my parents uh, have a cottage. And uh, One of my memories there is, well, two memories that stand out. One was uh, saying goodbye to my wife and son was really, really hard. Um, much harder than the previous January because I knew what I was going back to. And the other memory I had was watching Walter Cronkite on CBS News and watching Jane Fonda hug a 37-millimeter anti-aircraft crew from the North Vietnamese Army, which really, really upset me that an American could do that. I've never forgotten it. That in the, you actually saw that on TV? I saw it on Walter Cronkite while I was home on leave. The other memory I had, uh, there's actually a third memory. I went to my neighborhood uh, parish, and a young priest who I had not known uh, gave the sermon on Sunday. And I was sitting in there with my wife and son, and he was railing against the war and how uh, American servicemen were killing women and children. And uh, I started to get up and leave, and my wife didn't, wouldn't let me. She told me to sit down. But I couldn't believe that was happening in my home parish, to have, to have that happen. A fourth memory, now that I, you, you asked me these questions. My wife and I took three days off and went to one of the resorts in Maine. And we were laying by the pool, and an older lady struck up a conversation with us, asked us what we were doing. And I mentioned that I was stationed in Vietnam and I was home on leave. And her reaction was, Vietnam? I thought that ended a long time ago. And so she didn't have a clue. So, you know, I was exposed to uh, the average American who didn't have a clue and then a priest in my home parish calling me essentially a baby killer to my face, it was pretty demoralizing to, to go back to, uh, to Vietnam after that. And then um, in the fall of that year, uh, we had a seven-day R&R in Hawaii, and I met my wife in Hawaii and, and uh, where we had honeymooned in 1968 and went back, and that was very special, back to uh, Hawaii and, uh, in the October time frame. Wasn't so bad. It wasn't so bad. Uh, by then, I only had uh, three or four months left. I could see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, we had already got the next assignment, and uh, we were. I was looking forward to it. Uh, also, the heavy, heavy combat uh, that, that I had gone through, I knew was largely over. It wasn't near as dangerous day to day, and I was pretty sure I was going to survive. And, of course, in December was the... Um, the Christmas bombing of the B-52s over in the north, and, and which really brought North Vietnam to the table in a serious way and ended the war. And that, that was exciting then, but uh, really in October, it was not as so stressful going back. Did you travel any other places while you were in the service at that time? Well, not in, not in 1972. Of course, when I flew 141s, prior to that, I'd been all over the world in the 141. But... Uh, no, in 72, it was all about Vietnam. And the only, the only place other than, than Hawaii I went was um, Thailand uh, a few times. Do you recall any particularly humorous or unusual events? Oh, tons. Um, one of the ways when you're in combat is that you've got to have a sense of humor and, and uh, be really thick-skinned and people play practical jokes and, and you do a lot of stuff that, that's really funny. But I'll tell you one funny mission – 
of a friend of mine when we were flying out of Pleiku. He was flying in Cambodia, and he could see something on a rectangular field, and he couldn't make out what it was. And he kept looking and looking and looking, and he finally decided to go low, and he got right on the deck, and he, he came over the field, and he dipped down below the trees onto the field and looked over to, to the corner of the field that he, and realized it was a 37-millimeter gun, and the guys were moving the gun back in his direction. And he kind of went expletive deleted and then looked in front, and he was hitting the trees in front because he, he was so shaken by seeing this anti-aircraft gun. And he actually went through the trees and uh, scared the living daylights out of himself and uh, climbed up to altitude and started making it back home. And about halfway home, he, he decided that he'd take a couple of practice runs with his rockets and uh, for practice. And so he shot a Willie Pete, and uh, there was a tree branch stuck in his rocket pod that he didn't know about. And it hung up the Willie Pete, so it fired, but it didn't get all the way out the tube, and it threw him into a spin. And then he pulled out of the spin and, uh, and got back home. And I was uh, getting ready to taxi out, and I saw his airplane taxiing in, and he had branches in his rocket pod, and he had branches in his tail. And I said, I got on the radio and said, Ralph, looks like you had an interesting mission. <laughs> and he says, yeah, it really was. And, and so came back after my mission that night. And uh, the story he told, because uh, he, you know, he was doing something he shouldn't have done. He was below his minimum altitude, which is 1,500 feet. And uh, so the story he told was that he was taking a practice uh, rocket pass, and he had a rocket hung up, which it did occasionally. It threw him into a spin, and he was able to pull out of the spin just as he hit the trees. So he got the sequence backwards, and he ended up getting a uh, PACAF Well Done Safety Award and didn't tell anybody what really happened until after he left Vietnam. But, uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff like that that, uh, that goes on. What did you think of your fellow officers? Um, the guys in the squadron were top-notch. I, I'd known some of them before. They were academy classmates. Uh, I would trust those guys with my life. I did trust those guys with my life. Uh, I knew who was good and who was not so good, and we kind of talked it amongst ourselves that if we ever got shot down, I want that guy to be the one to run the rescue, not that guy. Uh, but by and large, uh, really, really good guys, uh, a few exceptions. Um, we had problems in those days on the enlisted force. Um, uh, a lot of them, not in the Air Force, but others had been drafted, didn't want to be there. Uh, the Air Force was all volunteer, but, but still they, they came to the Air Force to avoid the Army or the Marines in a lot of cases. Uh, drugs were a problem. Marijuana was a problem. Uh, and and uh, too many guys were smoking dope while they were looking for rocket attacks to, to do the siren. And, and so that was a problem. Racism was also a problem. Um, that, that you had to work uh, on the base. Um, guys in those days had this handshake called, I think, the DAP, and uh, this secret handshakes that they would do. And I mean, it was just sort of them and us kind of mentality, which was, which was not good. Not true in a flying squadron. Again, you're all pilots and uh, all commissioned officers with college degrees, and there was none of that. But it was all around you uh, on, on the base that was not, not so good. Um, but uh, you get very, very close when you fly combat with guys. Did you stay in touch with any of your buddies after the war? Oh, yeah. Uh, stationed with them after on various assignments. Uh, some I hadn't seen for years, but all of a sudden you see them someplace. Uh, I went to a, a, a FAC uh, reunion a couple of times, once as a four-star and gave a speech, which was kind of neat. A little intimidating even for a four-star because they had long bit left the Air Force. And, and uh, you know, these guys knew real combat and, and uh, not impressed at all by four-stars necessarily. But it was really fun. It was in Hawaii. Uh, but I have kept in touch with, uh, with a lot of them. And, and I know that you went on to stay in the Air Force. Did most of the guys you served with in Vietnam leave the Air Force? I would say 50-50 um, would be my guess. A lot of them, in those days, airlines were hiring. Um, 
And so they had opportunities on the outside. In those days, airline pilots made a lot of money. They only worked about 10 days a month. And that was what folks wanted to do. So I would say the retention was probably less than 50%. The Air Force was also downsizing, so it wanted guys to leave. Uh, so it was interesting. When I came back from Vietnam, um, my father-in-law threw a party uh, in Chicago at his country club. And uh, I had that night, I had probably five or six job offers, including with United Airlines. Because my father-in-law had served in World War II as a bomber pilot and got out of the Army uh, and got into private business and, and was a very wealthy man and had made a very good living for himself building suburbs in Chicago. And that's the model that he could see for me was that I would get out of the Air Force after the war. And, and uh, so I had all these job offers, but I really, I really had no serious, I didn't want to be an airline pilot. And I really didn't have a serious thought of leaving the Air Force at that point. I loved what I was doing. I loved the guys I was serving with. Uh, I was very motivated coming out of Vietnam because I, I uh, you don't say you enjoyed the combat, but it was sort of the ultimate in aviation. Um, and so I wasn't ready to leave the Air Force. And then some years later, when I was stationed at the Air Force Academy, um, I, I, my father-in-law visited us, and, and there was a cadet parade. And I looked over at my father-in-law, and he had tears in his eyes. And he said, I know why you stayed in, which was pretty cool to have him admit that. Do you remember what it was like for you when you were in country and you were getting short? Um, everybody kept a calendar, uh, and it wasn't a, it was a, a Julian calendar, so it was 1 through 365, and when you did day one, you crossed it off, and you did day two, you crossed it off, and so you end up getting a lot of crosses, but I was busy enough, I never got what they call short, where some guys got short and wouldn't take chances anymore, and you, and when you fly in combat, if you're going to be effective, it's all about calculated risks if you're going to be effective. I never really got that way. Um, I was overjoyed at going home. Believe me, I counted the days. Uh, frankly, if I hadn't been married with a, with a small child, I'd have stayed over there if they had let me. I, I loved what I was doing, um, but I was looking forward to going home and getting back with my family and, and, and all of that. But I never really felt short. Again, I was an instructor pilot, an evaluator pilot, and uh, I took that seriously, and um, I, I, I kept flying right up to the end. As an instructor pilot, what did you learn from your own piloting that had helped you as an instructor pilot? What were the mm. things you focused on as an instructor? Yeah. Um, well, one of the things, if you're, you know, there's, there's um, old pilots and there are dumb pilots, but there are no old dumb pilots. Okay, so you, you got to have a certain skill level as a pilot. Sometimes pilots get full of themselves and they, uh, they get too full of themselves. And I learned very early on that uh, there's no such thing as a perfect mission, that you always make mistakes and you learn from your mistakes. The idea is not to make multiple mistakes or serious mistakes. And so what I tried to teach guys is that you're going to make mistakes but they need to be small mistakes. They need to be recoverable mistakes. They need to be, they need to be not serious mistakes. And so you prioritize things and you fly in a disciplined manner and you know when to take a calculated risk. And so I tried to pass that, that on to them. That was probably the most important thing to pass on to them for their survival. And then there's the mechanics of flying and flying in instru instruments in the clouds and and a lot of guys coming out of pilot training didn't have any experience in clouds and stuff. I did because I flew the 141. So I had a lot to offer them in terms of trusting the airplane instruments, how to do it safely, and, and uh, help them build up their own confidence on being able to do instrument flying, which many of them didn't have a lot of experience with. So those are some of the things that I tried to pass along. Do you remember your last day in Vietnam? Not too much. Um, we went, uh, I think I was on a cargo air C-130, said goodbye to all my squadron mates and uh, headed down to Saigon and then caught the, uh, the Freedom Bird, they called it, 
And uh, you changed in civilian clothes when you started to go back home because uh, it, it was uh, not welcoming home and they didn't want you wearing your uniform. And you got off the Freedom Bird, I think at Travis, and then went down to San Francisco and caught a, a flight uh, back to Maine in, in civilian clothes. But it was telling that uh, they didn't want you in uniform, and traveling in uniform. Of course, today, kids travel proudly in uniform. And the men and women walk through airports and they get applauded, which is terrific. And where I saw that turn was the uh, return of Desert Storm, guys, where the country did this outpouring of uh, affection for the, for, for the guys, which is wonderful. So you took your uniform off before you left Vietnam? Or no, um, I think I I think I wore my flight suit all the way to Travis, and then and then uh, before going off base, got in civilian clothes to travel the rest of the way back home. When you got to Maine, what was your homecoming like? Oh, it was great. It was great, but eventful. It was, uh, of course, January. I left Vietnam uh, 366 days after I got there. So I left Vietnam on the 21st of um, January, and I probably got home on the 21st or 22nd. I landed in Portland, Maine. It had been had been snowing uh, uh, very hard. My wife uh, had gotten in a car accident on the way to the airport with my son. A person who hadn't cleared their windshield hit her, and of course she she happened to get hit right outside a family friend, and so she was able to go in there. And uh, the cop she explained to the cop the situation. The car wasn't seriously damaged, and she was not hurt at all. And so the cop took the information very quickly and, and let her go off. Uh, another family friend who was a politician in Maine uh, had gotten the mayor of Portland to come out. And, of course, I didn't want to see either one of them. All I wanted to do was get off that airplane, get my wife and son, and go back to our apartment and see my parents and all of that. But they wanted me to eat breakfast with them there at the Portland airport. So I had, had these two wonderful guys, and I very much appreciated them doing it because your ordinary returning vet didn't get that. So I had breakfast with them in the Portland Jetport uh, cafeteria and then uh, couldn't wait to go home uh, to, uh, to uh, spend some time with my family. How long now? This is where most guys are discharged from the service, but we know you, did, you didn't get discharged. How long did you stay home? Uh, before you went to your next assignment? I had, uh, I had about 30 days built up. And so I got to, uh, to spend all the time in Maine. Uh, we, uh, of course, we had to pack up and, and move to the new location uh, at the end of that and pack our household goods and, because it was a permanent change of station from Maine to uh, Dover, Delaware. Uh, but I, got to, I remember very vividly being in our little apartment watching uh, the POWs get released and just uh, bawling my eyes out with joy to see each one come through. And I knew a number of them to see them get released. It was terrific. So your next duty station was Dover, Delaware, back to Dover? Back to Dover, but this time in C-5s. And so uh, I tried real hard to go to, to fighters or to a FAC assignment in Hawaii but you go where the needs of the Air Force are. I tried to get fly F-111s, and in, uh, I tried to go to SAC. I, I wanted to do something different. I'd flown 141s. I'd flown O2s. I didn't want to go back to 141s. I'd already done that. C-5s was sort of more of the same, although a brand-new airplane, a different airplane. But the Air Force decided where I was going to go, and uh, so I saluted smartly, and off we went to, uh, to Dover, Delaware. Well, can you tell me about the c 5 uh, the the O2 weighed uh, 4,400 pounds. The C5 uh, weighed 769,000 pounds. It was the uh, largest airplane in the world. It was a big, big airplane, brand new, had lots of uh, reliability issues. They were pushing the state of the art. And uh, so uh, they tended to put experienced guys in the, in the C5, both in the enlisted force as well as the officer force. Um, Similar mission to the 141, lots of international flying uh, all over the world. Uh, I was at Dover for four years. Um, upgraded pretty quickly to um, uh, instructor pilot, aircraft commander, uh, very quickly. And then instructor pilot, evaluator pilot, uh, and was in uh, Wingstand Val when I left. Um, 
Interestingly, uh, one of the earlier missions that I remember, so this was 1973, um, was uh, I was a brand new aircraft commander in uh, October of 73 during the Yom Kippur War in Israel. And it was a very interesting time. Um, we were the only nation in the world to support Israel. Israel had been invaded by Egypt and Syria, uh, surprised. They uh, did not uh, have good intel. And so in Israel, they don't have land to trade for time. And they depend on their reserves very heavily. And so they didn't have their reserves mobilized. And they didn't have land to give up. And so what they sacrificed was their air force. So they had lots of guys shot down. It was very heavy combat. Uh, the United States was the only nation in the world that was supporting Israel. Uh, the president made a decision to support them. Uh, C-5 was the only airplane that could go nonstop from the U.S., other than the 747, to Israel, but it couldn't carry very much. Uh, and at those days, although it was air refueling capable, we had not trained the pilots in air refueling. So we had a few guys with B-52 experience and had done air refueling, and the, the concept was if we have to do this uh, on our own without any landing base between here and Israel, we're going to put those guys in, let them refuel, and wake them up for the refueling, and then when they finished doing the refueling, they'd go back to the bunk, and we'd take it the rest of the way, and they would just stay on the airplanes for however long it took, days and days and days and days. So that's what you did? You would fly it, and you had a B-52 guy with you? No, it turns out what we did is uh, President Nixon finally put the squeeze on Portugal to let us use the Azores. We had a U.S. Air Force base in the Azores, which is midway across the Atlantic. And so we'd go to uh, various arsenals and armies around the United States, pick up primarily either tanks or artillery shells, and then fly to the Azores, and then another crew would take it from the Azores. And we had no overflight, no country would give us overflight rights. And so we would go through the Straits of Gibraltar, in international airspace and across the middle of the Mediterranean. We had two aircraft carriers stationed in the Med, and we'd overfly them, and they'd give us air support cover with their fighters if somebody came up and tried to intercept us, and Libya tried a couple of times. Uh, and then we went into, uh, into Israel, offload, and then fly back out to the Azores. Another crew would take the airplane and continue on. It was very, very busy. Uh, the European countries were not supportive. In fact, they wouldn't even let us fly to Germany and carry our artillery shells on to Israel, our own artillery shells. So we would fly to Germany, pick up artillery shells, fly to the Azores, and then fly from the Azores to Israel. That's how isolated Israel was. And we would land in Israel, and with my first mission to Israel, we were met by Al Al stewardesses with roses. And uh, they would take us in, and we'd refile our flight plan while they were offloading the airplane. They had volunteers, some of them of Jewish Americans, uh, I remember, offloading the artillery shells from the C-5s onto trucks. And the trucks would drive up to the Golan Heights, and within uh, six hours or so, they were being fired out of an artillery tube. That's how close they were to be out of ammunition and how close it was to the front. Um, so while we were filing, uh, they would feed us in, uh, in base operations. And uh, they gave us postcards from Israeli children, and it would say something like, Dear American pilot, thank you for saving my country. Which was really touching, having come from Vietnam, where the South Vietnamese didn't really appreciate us, and the American people didn't appreciate us, but the Israelis did. And then on another mission at the end, as uh, Israel was rebounding, and they had encircled an, Egy an entire Egyptian division and were about to decimate it, President Nixon forced them to stop before the carnage began because Egypt was about to sue for peace, having been defeated. And uh, so that, that particular mission was not, we, didn't be, we weren't met by Al Al stewardesses with roses. They weren't very happy with us because they, they were ready to decimate these, these guys once and for all. And uh, so it was an interesting uh, be, uh, contrast between the, the two missions. But uh, the Azores was busy. Uh, we had guys sleeping in the hospital maternity wards because they were out of beds to sleep in. And, and uh, it was a very interesting, uh, the Israeli airlift was an amazing uh, show of American air power.
we're going to take a break and then start one here. Sounds good.